another year has passed and Economia Viva is back. This edition will bring you debates on the future of monetary policy, higher education, international politics and how to fight inequality. But what we are most excited about is to be back. Join us at Nova SP Kerkevelis campus. A school, a community of world citizens dedicated to the development of talent and knowledge that impacts the world. A school of business and economics with a fundamental role to play, supporting those who strive to be better. People, professionals, leaders, driven by insight and enterprise at our home in Kirkavelus. A top-ranked international school, member of the SEMS Global Alliance. Offering innovative and excellent pre-experience programs entirely taught in English. Bachelors in Economics and Bachelors in Management for a life-transforming experience with curriculum-enhancing activities and integration of technology advancements and digital ubiquity. Masters in Business Analytics, Economics, Finance, Impact Entrepreneurship and Innovation, International Development and Public Policy, and Management. Ranked by the Financial Times and Ed Universal, with 100% of our graduates working within six months of graduation at highly sought sectors and companies. We are widening our horizons. Together, we are a Nova School for the Future. Não sabe onde poupar, nem onde investir? Na Fidelidade é simples. Com o Fidelidade Savings, tem disponíveis várias opções. Escolha a mais adequada para o que pretende alcançar. Tem alguma questão? Fale com a sua agência ou mediador Fidelidade ou vá a fidelidade.pt. Fidelidade. Para que a vida não pare. Good afternoon. Welcome to... The, late, the, late, the last panel of um, the Economy of Viva seminars, the end of the new world order. My name is Katia Bruno, I'm a journalist, I write about foreign affairs, and today we have uh, three guests with us that are highly qualified to talk about the subject of um, this new world order that might be ending. Um, here on my left we have Ana Sancho Pinto, she's a Portuguese academic, um, she studies mainly uh, the international relations field. She, was a, she is a former Secretary of State of National Defense. She is currently a professor in, in uh, Nova University in the, the Social Sciences and Humanities faculty. Um, she's also a researcher. And uh, she, she was a consultant uh, for the UN on the Alliance of Civilizations Projects. Uh, we also have Paul Fortes, he's a former Minister of Foreign Affairs and former Vice Prime Minister. Um, he was min Minister for Defense um, from 2002 to 2005. He was for 16 years um, leader of, of the, the Popular Party in Portugal. And uh, he has a, a, a weekly commentary on national TV, on, on international politics as well. And finally, we have uh, Sofia Moreira de Souza, uh, which is the current head of the European Commission in Portugal. Um, she has 20 years of experience in EU affairs. She was um, second to the, the Portuguese Prime Minister of Foreign Affairs. She helped with the presiding of the Council of the European Union in 2007. She was an EU ambassador in Cabo Verde. Um, she was an assistant to the ambassador in, in the African Union um, and has plenty of experience on that field as well. With, with our guests introduced, um, I would like to explain to you how the debate will work. We will have uh, more or less 10 minutes presentation for each of our participants and then we will have the debate that will also be um, possible for, for our participants to ask questions um, in the end of it. And um, when thinking about this idea of the end of a new world order, um, I think it is 
it, we will have many, many issues to cover. Let's see if the time help us to, to talk um, about all of them. But uh, I would start uh, by Anna, if you can give your presentation. We'll be listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank for the Students' Union uh, to, to the invitation uh, that they made me to be here with such prestigious members of, of the panel. And um, it's an honor for me to be on the School of Business and Economics of Nova University. It's also my uh, university, um, especially to uh, talk on a topic that um, you have there, the, and, and Katia told about the liberal world order. And since I will do the, the, the first presentation, I'm going to start with a provocation that there is no liberal world order. So uh, my argument, um, it's, I, I teach theory of international relations, and in the last uh, uh, two academic years, we discussed a lot about this. There is no world order, and lesser, there is a liberal world order. And why do I have uh, this argument? First of all, because we need to know what is a world order. And the, the general definitions, theoretical definitions of world order, it's that we have a cooperation between liberal democratic states led by multilateral institutions and based on rules, norms, and principles that organize the behavior of states and institutions. This is the concept of the world order. And this world order, these institutions, these norms and principles imply a consentment, imply an agreement and not the use of force. So if you look to the world, you're going to see that yes, we have multilateral institutions, but these multilateral institutions are normally uh, organized by the power of states. And what we call, what exists, is the narrative of a liberal world order that is based on the centrality of the United States and that is based on liberal principles. And what are these liberal principles? We are talking about human rights. We are talking about the rule of law. We are talking about rationality. Uh, uh, rational decision on uh, behavior. We are calling, we are talking, <clears throat> I'm sorry, about promoting well-being, promoting progress. Uh, this is being politically liberal, but if you look to the world again, we do not have these shared principles, values, and norms. Uh, we have a, a, a minor uh, percentage of democratic states, if you look uh, to authoritarian states, and we have the principle of sovereignty and the principle of intervention applying these human rights. More, if we look to the nexus between security and human rights, normally institutions, and if you're going to see United Nations or even the Atlantic Alliance, we give priority to security more than we give priority to human rights. So, when I say there is no world order, is because these institutions do not have the power to promote the equality between states. We still have great powers, and we still have states that do not have the same voice and do not have the same influence in institutions. And if you're going to look empirically to the norms and the principles that organize uh, this world order, we're going to see that is mainly a Western world order and not a world, uh, a global uh, world order. Uh, I saw in the text uh, of uh, Patrick Porter that so more or less quotes Gandhi with a, a, a sentence that I think it's very interesting. That is, liberal order is an excellent idea. It just have been properly tried. So we, when we look, if there is an end to this liberal world order, I think firstly we should ask, uh, what do we have, what is ending, and what do we need to look ahead? And this is this second part of uh, um, this, this presentation, uh, or this first uh, uh, argument that I would like to make. That is, um, 
what organizes our world is economics and globalization. And being liberal is not only about free markets. It's not only about uh, uh, promoting uh, uh, the free uh, movement of people and at the same time we are going to recover the idea of boundaries uh, not to markets but to migrations. When we look to globalization today, we need to look to um, the relation between China and the United States. We need to discuss about protectionism. We need to, to discuss about the renationalization of foreign policies. And we need to look uh, to the consequences of this tension between the major actors of globalization. There is no such actor more uh, uh, that is more beneficial uh, of globalization, free market, and this liberal world order than the United States. But at the same time, we have a huge number of marginalized citizens in the United States that do not benefit from globalization. And the states need to respond to this. And I think there are three topics um, that we need to look ahead. The first one is the technological revolution. It's going to change markets, it's going to change labor capabilities, it's going to change economic structures. And it's probably not, I have 43 years, so I'm not so old as that. But when I look to my daughter, that is 11, I know that there, her capabilities need to be very, very different from the ones today. Are we preparing our generations? Are you being prepared to this technological revolution and the impact that is going to have on societies, on privacy, and on labor market? We need to look at the environment, and it's not only about climate change. It's when we decide to reduce the carbon footage, when we decide to change oil by other uh, um, energies, do we have the notion of the impact that is going to exist in other economies? What is going to happen to Middle East economies? What is going to happen in the African continent where there is the major percentage of internal uh, 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 people's movement after the Asia continent? Um, are we prepared to respond to this change from north to south to south-north movements? And this is the third topic that I would like to, 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 to raise, that is identities. We need to look about identity politics. It's not only nationalism and populism. We have a, a, a tension inside our societies that we tendly organize on democratic and authoritarian uh, uh, tension. But I think this division is reductionist. We need to look inside our societies, inside looking to the gaps between generations, between regions, between cultural communities, and we need to approach this on, uh, um, uh, um, how to say, uh, um, a global level, not on the global world, but uh, a, a multi-dimension uh, uh, level, and um, we should not expect a decrease of conflict. We should not expect a decrease of internal conflicts and civil war. And we should not expect a decrease of free uh, mobility of people. So I think more than look back and look to the end of a world era, we need to look ahead. And we need to think what the new generation have to say about this uh, new era. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anis and Spintu. We will hear now the presentation from Mr. Paul Portas. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be back to this uh, Nova SB project. I teach here. And um, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, 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 Usually on the discussions about uh, geopolitics, there's no more ambiguous word than strategic. Because strategic is 
such an umbrella where everything that is really strategic can be, and many things that are not strategic can also be admitted. The same with the word liberal. And by the way, a liberal in Europe is not a liberal in US, for instance. And it's typically uh, a difference or a, 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 the kind of definition, it's typical from the Northern Hemisphere and from a Eurocentric world problem. The world is no more Eurocentric. Um, so, just to answer with uh, many, many, many times in our lives, we cannot answer yes or no, definitely, to many questions. But if I consider the two questions the organization wants to approach, uh, I will answer with a, with a no and a yes. A net no and a net yes. Where is the net no? Do our international organizations, um, um, are they prepared, fitted, or updated, just updated to the new world order? Definitely no. Um, you just have to pay attention to a, a photo of the Security Council of United Nations. It could be a photo of 1946. Just pay attention to the five countries with a veto right. The five countries with the veto right are the countries that were winners of the Second World War. But the world is no more the world of 1946. So you have a problem because you don't have <coughs> what we, I would say, we need more in our days. You, we don't have uh, international crisis management system regular, organized, and effective. We just have some informal alliances, every day more informal alliances than before. Uh, so, for instance, you saw in, during the pandemics what were the real relevant international organizations. If you consider Security Council of United Nations, zero. If you consider NATO, zero. It was not a security problem. If you consider World Trade Organization that could be relevant, it's deadlocked. You had the European Union as a regional bloc. It was relevant. You have some international alliances, both private and public, like Gavi, for instance, if you consider. And you have an organization I think we need, we should reform, but we need, uh, which is um, World Health Organization, just to be, uh, to give you an example. The pandemic global crisis was the good example of the lack of an international uh, crisis management system. So we have to learn lessons and not wait for the next global crisis to verify and check that we don't have that international system. First point, the first remark I would underline. The second question is, do we need globalization after pandemics? Definitely, yes. Uh, globalization has today the same problem that had in the beginning. You don't have a global governance for globalization. Even WTO, which is a very relevant organization, um, has no, uh, uh, is not fitted for the digital economy. World Trade Organization was founded when the global economy on goods and services was not technological nor digital. So there is a gap, a huge gap, even in WTO, between yesterday and tomorrow. Yesterday economy and tomorrow economy. Um, and by the way, my, I'm always worried with, do we have instances, entities to solve problems, conflicts and disputes and avoid the worst level of conflict? WTO had one. 
doesn't work for the moment. We could have, WTO was very relevant for states because you could um, solve by arbitration a problem between two states. Uh, on trade, obviously, or investments. And uh, in our days, that instance has no judges and doesn't work. It's blocked by many reasons. Why do we need globalization? I, uh, my definition of globalization is very close to Anna, so I don't have a partial definition. Uh, for me, globalization is freedom of circulation of capitals, services, goods, and people. So I'm not a pro-globalist on capital services and uh, goods, but not globalist on people. I always show in my, in my classes here in Nova SBE how the most successful stories in the American economy are linked to first and second generations of immigrants. From the 500 largest companies of US, 45% were founded by immigrants or daughters and sons of immigrants. So, uh, we'll need, we obviously need globalization because I, I can't understand how can you theoretically can you increase growth without trade? Can you increase growth without investment? Can you increase growth without innovation? Trade. Trade. Um, uh, 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 investment and innovation are the core pillars of globalization. You couldn't explain the last 40 years in global economics without these three pillars. So my answer is yes, we have to reform globalization in certain, uh, reform some questions on globalization. We need global governance better than we have today, but we need, before everything, we need markets open we need to be back to opening markets. We'll become more and more poor and we lose a lot of time if we uh, remain confined or in um, with uh, economic excessive borders. So, uh, trying to contribute, to finish my remarks, initial remarks, trying to contribute about the the death of the old liberal order. I remember that my parents were educated in a world that was westernized, a world of the Atlantic, and a world, <coughs> in a way, Euro-America. Your generation is living in real time a completely different world. The world is no more Eurocentric. The world is much more Asian than it was. The world is less an Atlantic one and more a Pacific one or an Indo-Pacific one. And that's why we in Europe, we feel discomfortable with this shift. But don't think these are breaking news. The world was already Arab and um, Asian, some I would say 10 centuries ago, the epicenter, there is a very interesting criteria from McKinsey Global Institute, the epicenter of gravity, uh, the economic um, gravity, uh, epicenter of economic gravity of the world. And 10 years ago, 10, 10 centuries ago, the world was much more Asian and Arab than European or Westernized. Okay, so that's no, this is a, this is a, this is a, a new world story. What we are, uh, we are if, if we, we, ha we have this discussion in a Friday, in a very threatening Friday, if we consider images from Ukraine, oh my God, it seems we are back to the old order. 
Not exactly. The old water was cold but stable, with a lot of risks, but cold but stable, between Warsaw Pact and the economic global socialist model, socialist not in the European sense, obviously, and uh, NATO and the alliance between Europeans and Americans on the other side. That world exists no more. We are building a polarized world between the incumbent power and the challenging power. The incumbent power, it's in trouble. We all witnessed that. It's United States of America. The challenging power with a different political regime is China. And I will conclude with just two, uh, two um, remarks. It's very tough for a large majority of countries in the world to choose between tougher than before, much tougher than before, to choose between China rise or American leadership. You know why? Because China, through geoeconomics, became the first economic partner of more than 100 countries in the world. If you just look at the Financial Times usual map about uh, the world uh, designed by imports and exports, 20 years ago, the large majority of countries of the world imported or exported more from or to the United States. It was a blue map. Just pay attention to the map 20 years after, in 2020. The large majority of the countries in the world import or export more from or to China. That's a huge change. On the other end, and this is my final remark, it's very difficult for China to organize a security alliance, a collective security alliance. It was easier to U USSR or to the NATO countries. Why? It's, a it's very, we don't discuss it or we don't pay enough attention to that in Europe. Because the rise of China, the first problem, strategic problem of the rise of China, of the achievements of China that are obviously spectacular, if you compare China of Deng Xiaoping, beginning of Deng Xiaoping to today, it's unbelievable, the, the change and the achievements. But there is a problem. Non-relevant non country in Asia is comfortable with the rise of China. That's why not only economic growth migrated to Asia, but also political risk migrated also to Asia. So, when I was a child, the checkpoint in Berlin was the dangerous place in the world. In nowadays, you will get used to concepts and regions like South China Sea, Taiwan, Kashmir, and many others. The closest to us are Eurasia, and the others are in the Pacific or in the Indo-Pacific. So, this is a real, real change, but it's just a European way to define it, the end of liberal old order, okay? I don't know how a Chinese would answer that. Okay. Thank you very much. Now we're going to listen to the to the remarks of uh, Ms. Sofia Moreira de Souza. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. So first and, and foremost, uh, thank you to the organizers for the invitation, but also for organizing these debates. I had a chance to listen and joining in online this week and has been fantastic. So congratulations, and we will be here to continue partnering with you on this. Also, there is a big, it's a, I feel very flattered to share with you today here at the stage, but mostly I will be intending to get your questions and to address some of the issues that, or, or questions that you might have that have not been discussed here. I had planned to talk, in a, to, to, to address the two questions posed, but I can't resist to the, the points that were made here. 
And to start with, I'm not going to talk about strategic because I couldn't agree more. Strategic or liberal is very difficult to define, but I have a new one, which is geopolitical, which is also one of those words that you can mean it everything. Um, and it's difficult to define, but I think it's a word that we will be hearing quite a lot coming from the European Union and from the, the days that we face and the world we face. Another point, and, and I will talk about it in a minute, and the, the other issue I would like to talk is, I couldn't agree more than the sense that we do not, the international or intergovernmental organizations have proved not to be fit to address the issues of nowadays. We've seen it recently, you mentioned the vaccines, the, the, um, the pandemic, but we see it recently with the situation in the east of Europe, with the, the fact that not even the OSCE is able to, to, to play its role on the top of all the other organizations that were already mentioned here before. But there is one, and I was quite happy that uh, Paulo Portas mentioned it, the European Union. And I re represent the European Commission, I've been working in the European Union, I'm probably um, very well positioned to, 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 to talk a lot on the positive criticism but there's something that I think made clear is that I was very happy that the European Union was able on the pandemic to react, that the European Union had invested before on financing research and working with institutions like in, in Africa, the Institut Pasteur in Senegal, for instance, um, and is, is committed and was at the, the, the genesis of the creation of COVAX the mechanism that delivers vaccines to uh, lower, mid, middle and, and low in income countries in the world. Not enough, but I'm quite happy that the European Union is there and was able to play this role. Now, um, going back, uh, and, and the, the, the point, sorry, about the, the international organizations, that they are not fit for the challenges, absolutely that we face the world, there is no way back. Globalization is there, is there to stay, and there's plenty of advantages. And if we compare it to the era of the empires that we had this two centuries ago, um, obviously the globalization is a much, or can be a much fairer world and much better for us all. But I think that the globalization, and my theory, is that globalization needs strong organizations because globalization to operate needs rules. And ones defining or implementing these rules cannot be only the states, individual states, because in that case is who plays or who chooses the rules. And how do we operate in this complex reality? And I think that globalization calls for intergovernmental and strong international organizations. Now the question is how do we get there? Because obviously we have international organizations, they are not delivery, they need to be reformed. To be reformed we need the member states of these organizations to agree on the reform. How do we get there? And this um, reminds me when I started working on, on, in the Council of the European Union um, some years ago, many years ago, I had a director general who had this definition of foreign policy saying foreign policy is the art whereby you convince the others to do what you want. So far so good. The problem is sometimes the others don't want to do what you want and so how do you go about it? And then he used to say well first thing you need to know what you want. And within the European Union, this is quite a challenge because there are 27 sovereign countries plus there's what is quite unique in the European Union is that you just don't have only the sum of the parts, you have much more than that because you have the dynamics, you have the, 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 the countries that whose interests, whether on a regional sphere or on economic level, that they come up with a particular position that is a little bit more than the national one, but that doesn't really match the will of the 27. So already to define what you want is quite difficult. Then the second part is once you know what you want, how do you make what you want happening? How do you convince the others? 
And then the European Union has a large array of, of instruments and of policies, and trade is clearly one of the most important ones. And I remember as well a lot of briefings that used to, to see or contributing to, and even briefings that I got in my recent um, latest positions, which were talking about the EU being the biggest, the, the, the biggest investor, the biggest trade partner, the biggest foreign donor, the biggest everything, but has not been always the biggest player or the, the one able to influence the way that developments occur in our world. And so, um, even now, talking about China and about the Indo-Pacific, um, recently I heard that the European Union is still the biggest trade partner. We, we're still the biggest trade partner in the region. It's not China, which is quite impressive. But what do we get out of it? So, yes, we have trade policy. We have um, uh, credibility and in terms of the way we are, in terms of the human rights, of the commitment to democracy. After all, we are probably the biggest community of democracies operating really in terms of an organization, the European Union, able to decide on and, and influence rule of law in the European space. And this has, of course, repercussions all around the world and so many countries that want to join and so many countries in our neighborhood that try to implement and, and to adapt the, what we call the acquis communautaire. So we do have a policy of sanctions related to trade or related to the, the freedom to enter our territory. We do have foreign instruments. Now we have the Global Europe, which is about 80 mil billion euro that we will be able for the next seven years to contribute and to engage with countries all around the world and, and assist on development. Um, we have the, the Global Gateway Initiative, which we want to, to leverage the private sector to engage on developing infrastructures all around the world. So we are not short of instruments. But how do we translate this in the influence we need and we would like to see in the world? And there comes the geopolitical and the, the, the decision and the definition of the current commission and of the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, saying, I want to have a geopolitical commission. Now, the question was like the liberal and strategic, what geopolitical means? It means basically to bridge the gap between having this economic and being a strong economic actor with being a strong political actor. Now, how are we gonna do this? How are we going to convince the others? How we engage in our foreign policy on convincing the others how, what we, we would expect from them? And we, I mean, was, was, was mentioned here before, we, we have China, we have India, we have Latin America, we have the US, but actually when everybody thought this century will be dom politics will be dominated by China and by Asia, we still see the biggest threat or the biggest challenge we face in our borders comes from Russia, comes from the East. Now, how are we gonna deal with this? We do have platforms, we have constant dialogue, we have ministerial meetings, we have summits, we have um, trade agreements with our neighbors, but how and how is the European Union going to position itself in this very complicated uh, context? Now, I personally only see one way, which is we can influence a lot on what we do, but we influence a lot on what we are. And the community of democracies if the European Union is able to maintain unity, to react in a unified way to the outside. And if we are able, despite the challenges we face and, and um, the, the different context and the different realities in the 27 member states, but if we are able to keep this unity, if you are able to keep true to the grounding and founding uh, uh, fathers of, of the, the what is today the European Union and of the Treaty of the European Union and the, 
namely the treaty, the, num the, the article number two that mentions the basis of the European Union as democracy, as equality, as freedom, as um, uh, equal, e equality and solidarity. If we manage to respect this, I think it's halfway to, to be geopolitical relevant. Then the other half, maybe I think it's worth to have a discussion and see what else can be done and can be done better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Svia. We will now kick off this debate uh, to explore a bit more of the ideas that um, we were listening to. Thank you so much for all the, the very interesting presentations. When I was hearing you three, and um, it came to my mind this idea of um, the concept by Francis Fukuyama of the end of history, that we would see the end of history after the, the end of the Cold War. And um, 30 years later, what we see is that either for some, like Anna, the world liberal order does not exist, and even for those who believe it might have existed, it was definitely a brief period. Um, I think we can agree that with a, a state like China rising, which is part of WTO and uses capitalistic tools, but it's also a politically authoritarian state, uh, we can no longer say that the US are the ones leading um, the world order. At the same time, we had the economic crisis of 2008, and that created a lot of discussion about globalization and uh, free markets, which also translated into politics with a lot of anti-globalization uh, movements and parties that are influencing uh, European politics. But also, um, we heard how sometimes it seems that we are back to the Cold War with the situation in Russia, but not exactly. And I wanted to, to start this debate by, by asking you three, if do you believe that the, the situation with Russia on the borders of Europe and with all the troops near the border in Ukraine is in some way an attempt by Russia to um, appear itself as relevant in a world that seems to be bipolarized between the US and China? And if so, how can an institution like the EU do with a situation that it's so close to its borders, but who at the same time, apart from the last few weeks, it seemed to have been dealt primarily between the US and Russia diplomatically. Um, where were the European leaders? Was it because they were glad to outsource that part to the, UK, to the US? Or was it because the US is still dominating that world stage? I don't know, what are your thoughts on this? Who wants to go first? <laughs> Well, um, when you ask that uh, if the Russia uh, um, approach is a way to show that is relevant, my first idea was here is the Eurocentric again. Because um, we look to the situation on our perspective because they want to be on the table, they want to uh, uh, be relevant. I think that sometimes we, to understand the situation and to understand the decision-making process in Russia, we should put ourselves in that territory and look around. And look around what have happened in the last 20 years. And again, we should look, and I'm, I do not have the privilege to, to be an historian, but it's not history if we look to 2014 and we look what happened in the case of Crimea, etc. So we know what happened, and Russia, uh, Russia knows exactly what to do inside the European Union. Russia wants to divide the Atlantic Alliance and wants to divide the European Union. Uh, Sofia and, uh, was talking about unity and solidarity, and uh, uh, Paul Portas was, was uh, raising a, a very interesting question, that is, what states react on China rising? And you say some react in one way inside the European Union. We do not have the same position regarding the China rising. So Russia knows exactly what to do. Uh, sanctions. Yes, we have sanctions, and the president of the European Commission can uh, uh, apply that, but who applies sanctions? It's the states. It's the sovereign states that apply that sanction. Are we talking about uh, um, the, the, uh, 
gasoduto de Pipeline. The pipeline, uh, the Nord Stream pipeline, are we talking about energy? Are we talking about Russia feeling completely surrounded about for the, the Atlantic Alliance and the political project of the European Union? So, it's not the question of being relevant. It's the question of who have power and you, who can exert this power. And Russia wants to uh, show um, that it's still a state, it's still an actor. And yes, the United States are in a big crisis. And I think that more than an international crisis, I'm more worried about the internal crisis in the United States, the crisis of democracy and institutions. I'm sorry, I could not forget the image of the Congress being attacked. And I think I, I I'm a political science student that learned that democracy was thought uh, uh, in England, developed in the case of the United States, and when I was at the Capitol, I was in the house of democracy. And two years after that, uh, there is a crisis in the United States. So, uh, do, do we are, are we really looking to the case in Russia and the case in the Ukraine um, as a reaction to someone that want to be relevant or are we looking to the problem? And the problem is how we dealt with Russia in the last 20 years and here again multilateral institutions and recognition and legitimacy. And I think to approach Russia we need to take this into account. It's very interesting, the question, because if you listen Vladimir Putin saying, okay, I cannot agree with France because France is not the leader of NATO. So I can agree with the United States. Confirming not only what Anna was saying, but his mindset is a Cold War one. Uh, it's very bizarre, the idea that United States and uh, Russia can reach an agreement about Europe, about Ukraine. It's not exactly about Honduras in the American continent, okay? It's not, yes, I'm not mentioning Syria, Libya, etc. So, first of all, I personally think that uh, there was a melancholic reflection, for example, Maybe in the beginning of its accession to power, Vladimir Putin was tempted by such a thing as a Europe from Lisbon to Vladivostok. I don't know if the Western leaders did everything they could to make more comfortable the relation between Europe and Russia. But this is no more um, a, a question for today. It's lost in translation somewhere in the, in, in the precedent crisis. The second thing I want to uh, remark is, pay attention, um, uh, 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 you Soviet Union was a break in the Russian history. It was not Russia that was a break in the Soviet Union history. What you have in Moscow is eternal Russia. With some heritage from Soviet Union, an oligarchic economy, a nuclear power, which is an heritage from the Soviet Union. So the Russia is the largest nuclear military power of the world. Um, but this is Russia. Russia, I think it's, you can wake up and sleep at the same time in Russia, from east to west. It's European and it's Asian. They have 90 nationalities inside, 90. They were never democratic. This is pure, um, historically evident. Uh, I say, I sorrow it, I, 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 I regret it. But don't forget, they seem to be a nation more used to obey than to choose. How many years of democracy you had in Russia? 1,000 years? 
maybe two, three, in the beginning of the 20th century before the, 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 the revolution, or in the, immediately after the fall of Soviet Union. They are not used to the democratic regime, okay? I'm not saying one day can be different, yes, but just mention they have. They are very used to, they are very, 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 very used to autocratic, centralized power. <clears throat> and like the Chinese, they fear fragmentation of power. Because they know what happened in history. So, if you can, who, what is the genealogy of uh, Vladimir Putin? You can mention the Tsar, you can mention the communist leaders, or the KGB one but you can also mention Catherine the Great. So this is, uh, 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 and our relation, uh, uh, you do, uh, there are two things you don't change in international politics, history and geography. It's our neighbor, and it's a very tough neighbor. Um, finally, a reflection on, um, I think I, I remember just to, to, to answer to the question precisely, I remember a former Secretary of State in the United States of the 60s, that about UK, about the end of the British Empire, that one century ago controlled 23% of the sea, of the oceans. Okay, UK was a superpower. And after the fall of the, the, of the British Empire, UK was no more a superpower. And there was a former Secretary of State of the United States that said, Okay, UK is the only country I know that was formerly a, a superpower, but found a reasonable place between those who are not powers and those who are the new superpowers. It's a good definition of UK. It's no more a superpower. It's still a nuclear power, what is very relevant. And um, they found their place or they are looking to find their place in the world, you can, say, you can say, in a way, that Russia is trying to fight irrelevance and showing the world that in, in some specific aspects, they are relevant. I personally think there was a definition of Russia from President Obama may be a little bit arrogant when he called Russia a regional power. From superpower to regional power is uh, probably an underestimation because they are first nuclear military power in the world. And if you consider the 20 years of Putin, you had seven military interventions of middle or little scale in the perimeter of former Soviet Union. So, what is in the, in, in the Putin's mind is, is trying to re, a, redef, a redefinition of the security border of Russia. So, my, just my a final remark about the United States. One of the risks of a new polarization without international organizations adapted to a new polarization are misperceptions. One of the huge risks of the current situation is if Beijing thinks like they seem to think sometimes that the decline of America is irreversible. And then they can think US are not going to stand for Ukraine military. Would U.S. stand for Taiwan? If I pick the coercive way and not the political one? Or a replication of this question. Hong Kong felt without no relevant international reaction. The Hong Kong we knew exists no more. And if in Beijing they think Hong Kong felt Taiwan can fall. 
and what are the consequences for all the Asian region. So, we really need at least a red phone between Beijing, uh, a red phone between Beijing and Washington. And I would add, if you, Europe wants to be relevant, has to solve the, 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 the defense and security question in Europe. But at least we need a framework to avoid major crisis. And we don't have it. We had more framework during the Cold War than we have now. So. Sophia, <laughs> wanted to ask you about that specifically. How can the EU stand between the US, China, and now Russia also as a foreign policy challenge, a real one? We, we started with a question that was complex enough, how to deal with Russia. Now you add China into it. <laughs> So it's not fair. It's not fair. The world is not fair <laughs> at all. <laughs> now, um, picking up maybe on the first part about Russia, do we know how to deal with Russia? I don't think so, because we are where we are. So that shows that whatever we have done until now was not probably the best way to do it. That there could have been other ways now. But as as was said, let's bygones be bygones that now we have to concentrate is the challenge that we have and how we're going to to move ahead. I think the first step and coming back is to, to provide a united response. Whatever the response will be has to be united in terms of the European Union. We just saw yesterday or two days ago, uh, the high representative uh, wrote a letter to, to Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, in reply of a letters that he had addressed uh, different member states. The fact that we, we have an European answer um, is important and really matters because that's something, as, as uh, was said here, that Russia is interested in divide. And so as long as we manage to be united is already a first step. I think it's, it's, it's what we need. The second is to, to address Russia with diplomacy, but we also have to think about deterrence. We have to use the two, the two ways. We need to talk, we need to listen, we need to understand. Now something that was also said, and I couldn't agree more, is about things that you cannot change in the world is geography and history. And unfortunately, everyone dealing, or most of the people dealing with foreign policy or with external relations, miss history quite a lot. And and it's important to understand what, where Russia comes from, how the situation is that it is today, and things just don't happen one day from the next. It's the same with China. If we look, China is rising. Well, a few centuries ago, China, as an empire, had, had the knowledge and had techniques and had an economy that was blooming in the, in the globe. So, the things that things are changing, yes, the things are changing, well, the world is changing, but it's important that we reflect that, yes, there are ups and downs, and maybe we need to be less Western-centered. Already the word western center is very Western, because Western of what? I, I, was, I remember discussions in South Africa where some uh, uh, colleagues there would say, yeah, because you know the West is like, but when you look from here, the West, I mean, the West is Argentina. Um, not really the north. So it's all already this concept. We have to change a little bit and think from where do we where do we stand. But um, we we do need to to reflect and think, go back in history and understand the starting point and try to see the grievances of the other side. This being said, there are now three points that Russia continues doing that cannot stay unanswered which is three kind of rules that for the European Union in its relations with the world has established a sort of um, rules of the game so that you, um, you respect the right of sovereignty of independent states to decide about their security architecture or about the club they want to belong to, that you don't revert to the use of force before you really exhaust all the other means or unless you are under threat and that you respect territorial integrity. Now, we see that these principles are now being um, not respected, not followed, 
but were they shared? Does Russia share these principles? Yes, but maybe they don't see the point, maybe they do feel under threat, so they think that the use of force is justified because Russia is under threat. So it all depends on where do you stand and how do you see this. But from our side, from the European Union side and from the 27, we cannot just sit and watch this. And now I'm thinking about relationship with the US, and, and don't get me wrong, I mean, it's, it's our partner and we do have the, the, the Atlantic relationship is very, very important. But while when the European Union is committed to multilateralism and we have to engage on multilateralism and, and play multilateralism as long as we can, we have to be ready to stand and play autonomous when we can't use multilateralism. And I, a, 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 now a sentence comes to my mind of the previous president of the council that once said this, um, if you need a helping hand, you find one at the end of your arm. And I think that we need to have an independent and strong relationship with the US, but on security and as a security provider, it's seriously time that we stand on our feet and we think, um, that doesn't mean I, I'm saying that we need to have an European army or whatever, that's not the strength of the European Union, it's not military force. But we also have to think, Russia is our neighbor, is not the US neighbor. So the ones that should have a stronger word on this and should be more involved and should find a way to discuss things on the diplomatic and the, through negotiation is us. We cannot expect someone else standing on the other side to address issues that are really hot on our, on our borders. I think in a one way or another, we could say the same to China. And we need to have an independent relationship with China. I mean, at the moment, we see China as a, a, a partner, as a competitor, and as a rival. And we will have to play in these three aspects. And, and in our relationship with China, it has to intensify. We have to have further dialogue. We have to know China better. But we do need to, to, to also explain what our red lines are. But for that, and coming back to the, the principle on the foreign policy, we need to know ourselves. What do we want? What our red lines really are? And how far are we ready to go? And this has to be done at 27, in unity. Otherwise, we'll be totally irrelevant. Um, as uh, Mogherini used to say that there are only two types of countries, the small ones and the small ones, who th the small ones who know that they are small in Europe, she was referring to Europe, and the, sm the small ones who think they are big. And indeed, I mean, if we look at the scale of the globe, the 27, we matter if we stay together and if we are strong and if we manage to get this famous common foreign security policy really off the ground and if we manage to agree on how to address and relate to uh, in, in, in the world. If not, it's, it's going to be very difficult, even if there is a miraculous situation. Uh, Thank you, Sophia. Let's open the discussion uh, to the audience. Uh, let's see what topics might come up in the last few minutes we still have. If anyone wants to ask questions, we have one over there. Hi, hello. Thank you for uh, taking my question. I would like to ask the, the panel, in their collective judgment, why they think that... Um, can you hear me with the, with the mask? Yeah. Russia annexed Crimea in 2014, and nothing really happened uh, since then. So why do you think that the, they've chosen now to invade or not to invade? Um, Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe if there are other questions, we can round them all up to save a bit of time. I'm also not sure if we have online questions. Yeah, if there's one. Uh, to the EU representative, can she please elaborate how the EU did a good job on the beginning of the pandemic, as she affirmed, and who 
and who we should call in Brussels regarding foreign policy subjects? Uh, so the only question so far online. Thank you. Let's go with the first one then, and then we went to Sofia. So why was there no international reaction to the Crimea situation in 2014 and how that might impact now? I don't know who wants to go first on that. There was no international reaction but because of a bad reason. There is a, re a good reason and a bad reason. The good reason is to avoid war. It's interesting to question. Okay, there was no reaction. There was no conflict. They invaded. They stay. But just think a little bit about the alternative. You would fight them. The Americans or the Europeans, you would have had a war. Uh, okay, the bad reason is um, nor, nor, neither US nor European Union were too much worried with Crimea. And I, I would add <coughs> two provocative things. Uh, Anna was in government, I was in government. Sophia works with uh, the European institutional uh, bodies. Um, maybe we could not say that in government, but we should think and say more what we think. There is a possible agreement on Ukraine. We all know that. It's a no, no agreement. Russia doesn't invade Ukraine, Ukraine will not become a member of NATO. Everybody knows this is the possible agreement. It's unstable, but it's the only possibility I can see in, uh, in reality for the moment. And um, the, 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 the second thing is we are, I'm um, I'm very comfortable saying this because I, I admire, as it is public and obvious, Angela Merkel's uh, job and legacy. There are two decisions of Angela Merkel I have serious doubts. One is not, a rel is not exactly directly relevant for this debate, the phase out of the nuclear. But the critical non-decision of Angela Merkel was to accept the increase of gas dependence of Russia. Sorry to say, in a very transparent way, our European, def our European dependence on oil, and mainly gas from Russia, it's a fact, and facts are facts. That means we can be vocal but we cannot, in the current situation, risk a problem with our uh, supply of gas. Could you imagine what would be a winter in Europe, in half of Europe, not in Europe, in half of Europe without the Russian supply? Second consequence, which is tougher. We think in sanctions. The Americans think in sanctions. Maybe we are not thinking in the same sanctions. Because um, uh, 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 there is a limit. Germany is Germany. It's 49%. I cannot understand how is it possible to reach a situation where um, German dependence on Russian gas is 49%. So. Maybe we should reconsider. We, that we don't change this from one day to another. And we should reconsider our energetic dependencies. And not having mono dependencies because there are six or seven EU countries more than 50% dependent on the Russian gas. So facts are facts. Can you, from one day to another, risk problem of supply just to uh, 
trying to help you to answer, uh, to answer your questions. Anna, I don't know if you want to add something to this as well. Well, I, I think that in 2009, um, we, we, we can, my first lesson is, is we agree not to act. And uh, of course, neither of the actors wanted a war. Uh, but what we said to uh, the Russian regime and, and to President Putin is you can do what you want. And he made what he want, not only in yeah, Crimea. Yeah. Yes, not only in Crimea, and that is my point, is that after Crimea, after 2014, many other things happen. Well, I know more in the case of the Middle East, in the case of Syria, in the case of Libya, in the case of all uh, uh, North Africa with a lot of military agreements, and in the case of Turkey with the, the, the defense uh, uh, agreement uh, in, in the case of Turkey. Why? Because defense industry is the main pillar of the regime in terms of economics. So, of course, that they have energy and they have the military, uh, uh, the defense industry. These are the two main pillars of the Russian regime. Uh, and yes, it's the great uh, uh, nuclear power, but then we have the problem of technology. Uh, because the development of uh, Russian industry is not in the same path as in the case of China or, of course, in the case of the United States. Well, do not compare with Europe because we have a problem there. But my point here is that it's not only what we say we are, is what we do. And in the case of Crimea, and I really... Um, I always say I do not do uh, uh, future in the I do not see future in the cards. But there is no indicator that uh, we're going to have a different position. We do not announce a war with three months earlier. We are talking about this invasion since October, November. Um, and today we have F-16, uh, uh, United States F-16 uh, um, in, in the field. Um, we are measuring what, where are our red lines. But there is a slightly problem. There are uncontrolled events. And this is really dangerous. There are uncontrolled events. And something that could be very simple from one hour to the other can scale in a war. Or fake events. Of, well, fake events. yes. In the beginning of the Second World War. Yes, um, yes. But then we have to prove it's, it's fake and we, we start in the, the spiral. And my second point, and to be very brief, it's going, and since Sophie is going to talk after me, it's uh, about strategic autonomy. I have a huge conceptual and political problem with European strategic autonomy. And the first one is energy. We are not talking about strategic autonomy uh, uh, only on defense. We are talking about chains of value. We are uh, uh, today, I don't know if it's your experience, but if you want to buy something, it takes one month, two months, and very simple things. So Europe has a problem of uh, uh, a chain uh, uh, provide many, many services. Of course, we have a problem of energy. We have, uh, 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 Germany has 49% of dependency, and Portugal about Algeria, uh, yes, and Portugal about Algeria and the pipeline of Morocco. We also have this problem. So strategic autonomy for European Union is this is not only about defense, and we could talk about defense, it's much more. It's on economy, it's on industrial revolution that we need to do. We need to look to our industries and learn that they are not suitable. It's like multilateral organization that, that we talk. Our, our, our industrial structure, our industrial base, is not done to the future, is made to the past. And, and we need to think about that. Sophia, if you want to go on this strategic yeah. autonomy, I will just ask you to keep it brief because our time is finishing. And we also have the other question about the pandemic in the EU. Right. 
on sorry the for the <laughs> on the strategic autonomy is obviously I would put the focus much more outside the, the defense and security, but is actually on, on energy is a concrete example and why we need the Green Deal and why we need to lead on the fit for 55, but to reduce the dependence on, on gas. So this is, it's, I think there's the realization um, and it's become very clear from, for, for the 27 member states as well that we cannot rely on thinking that we can get things from the outside just because we have the money and we can afford it. But it's about connectivity, it's about IT, it's about the data, it's about investing on research. And so it's, it's, a, it's a big array and on the Commission side, there's work has been done in that regard and we need to advance in the different sectorial areas. So if, if, I, was, if I was understood as, as talking about security, no, it's about security of our daily lives actually more than, or, or not only the security in terms of the security and defense. Now, um, on Russia, I think that everything has been said and, and the, the, the point there, why now? Because the question was why do we think that now uh, there is this reaction from Russia? Well, clearly it's a bit of a game here and it's also a sort of a power game and to demand the reassurance from the others that Ukraine will not join NATO, that the situation that has happened maybe with, with other countries in the past, um, and that's not going to happen with Ukraine followed by Georgia and, and, and other countries in the, what was perceived as the sphere of influence. Um, and this is, is something that we will have to deal with, but in, indeed I think it's, it's pretty much that, is, is, is a request for the reassurance. I agree with Anna, I don't think the plan is to start a war, but I also agree with the point that the, the, the biggest danger is unforeseen events, mishaps. Um, you know, a, a plane that gets, uh, a, a commercial plane that comes down because there's someone made a mistake. Um, this kind of the, the, the things do happen and cannot be, and when the tension is very high, these incidents tend to happen more quickly. So we, we really need to work to de-escalate. Now, on the point of the pandemic, if there's something where the European Union showed and proved that was up to, to, to react and that was very good that the European Union was there, was the reaction and the action that has followed with the pandemic. I admit, and it's true, that at the beginning this caught us all by surprise and there was a lot of decisions taken of the member states individually and of this dealing with the unknown and with the unexpected that caused a certain confusion. But if we look at what happened in 2020 and 2021 and if we think about 2020, already April 2020, we were doing the first steps to get COVAX uh, off the ground, that we were, the, the European Union was the only actor in the world that did not, not only not uh, uh, forbidden the exports of the vaccines in the EU, to, in the territory, but even gave and facilitate the access to vaccines to third countries. I was in Cabo Verde when the first COVAX shipment arrived there in uh, 2021 in March, early March, but there were other countries that received earlier. And the biggest contributor to it was, uh, at the, the time, was the European Union, was the country that stepped in, the, the, was the, the entity that stepped in the financing of the World Health Organization when the, the, the United Nations, the, the United States pulled out, was also the, the Commission made the efforts and managed to coordinate the, 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 the levels on which member states will react on the opening and closure of the borders, because at the beginning this was a very much a national reaction, but then there was the coordinated response and trying to get the criteria under which we'll decide which would be the regions more affected that would have more difficult access in terms of the, the, the opening of the borders and was the EU next generation. I mean, the, 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 the financial answer, the package that was put together and the increase in the, in the, the, the financial instruments on our foreign policy, the global Europe on Nidiki, shows that the European Union was able to respond um, timely, okay, could, could be er, even earlier, but at least I don't see any other organization or even any other individual state that in the world stage has been able to express and to work on solidarity the same way as the EU did 
both in the vaccines, on the financial package, and on trying to coordinate the reply and the way that the member states were, were dealing with this. Was it enough? No. We need to, to, to go beyond this and we need to increase the vaccine exports and delivery to third countries? Yes. Do we take lessons from this pandemic? Uh, surely we do, and namely the, the strategic autonomy needed, but also the need to have an international organization that is able to deal with this kind of situation. So the health summit was something that was quite important and the follow-up to it will be even more. Is there more to be done? Yes. But if we compare to what others have done, I have to say that I'm quite proud of working in an institution that has reacted this way. Well, unfortunately, our time is up. I don't know if there are any last question that might come up. Yeah, there's, there's one. one. Uh, thank you so much. Um, it's been a really interesting uh, talk. I was actually just leaving, but I decided to stay for a bit longer. Um, I actually have a question back to Russia because it, it feels like you, you we kind of closed that theme, but I actually have a question which is on my chest and I want to share it. Um, so we are at the University of Nova, which is one of the leading critical institutions, universities in general are supposed to be. But every time I hear these stories and, and, and opinions nowadays, especially in media about Russia or China, particularly Russia these days, I feel they are incredibly one-sided. And I don't know if some people feel the same, but I feel always very one-sided argument. And the argument is very simple. Russia, 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 Russia. Um, but for me, as an academic and researcher, even though I'm not in politics or anything, it, it, it kind of makes me sad because I rarely hear more opposite arguments or counterbalancing arguments. And you mentioned that we need to understand these countries, we need to understand their histories, we need to know where they come from to better uh, d have a better diplomacy. So I have uh, two questions just to maybe provoke a bit and maybe, maybe arouse a bit of more critical thinking, in my opinion, on this thing. First question, hypothetically, if there was a peace in Europe and we would be able to somehow have a reasonably healthy relationship with country like Russia, then who would American system, American military industrial complex, sell weapons? That's the first question. And second question, um, hypothetically speaking, imagine in Mexico, for example, Mexico, there is a coup. And the coup happens in Mexico, which is overthrowing the president or whoever in Mexico City. The coup is sponsored by, let's say, Russia in this case, and there's evidence that it has been sponsored by external countries like Russia. And then Russia promotes and argues publicly that they want to promote the sovereignty of Mexico because they have a right to choose what they want. Then they support them militarily by sending weapons to Mexico. Then they want to drag them in a military organization because they have a right to choose what they want. And then they as argue in the same line of argument, uh, essentially agreeing to build potentially military bases right under the belly of America. So my question is, how would America react to such scenario? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Unfortunately, we are on a very, very short timing. Uh, Mr. Paul Portos actually has to leave right now. So just, he's catching a plane. Two, three words. I don't know if anyone wants to comment on these provocative questions as they were classified. As. So the first question, uh, Anna is saying she, she couldn't hear it well. May I ask a question after I have explained yes. my slide? Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Just to say one thing to your question. Um, you may be right with one exception in your uh, rationale. Ukraine become an independent country and it's not supposed to have military exercises of 100,000 people in the borders of an independent country for free. So, you're right. Ma many times you see in the Western press some bias uh, criticism on Russia. Uh, if you compare with Russian press, 
you would find, obviously, very biased argumentation about the Western countries. But um, the, the net contributor to the escalation of this question is Vladimir Putin himself. And as he knows that EU has no army, Ukraine is not NATO member, US would not stand military for Ukraine, the fact will have a minor, major, or intermediate conflict depends much more on Putin than others, in my opinion. Just, also, uh, sorry, I will try to pick my plane to, yes. to the north. Yes, go, go ahead. We are also closing very quickly, so just to hear your, your thoughts on, on these questions. I don't, okay. Just to compliment, um, besides the idea of the military exercise, that is a huge military exercise, the question of Crimea maintains as the same. So there is the occupation of uh, one territory of Ukraine, and uh, of course, we could not forget that. I understand when you say Russia, 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 and we put always, and that's why uh, uh, my, my first topic was we need to put ourselves in that territory and in that community and look around. And around, it's also uh, uh, um, NATO, 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 EU, EU, EU. So uh, we could not balance because we are framed on geopolitical and geostrategical narratives that put us in, the, in that, same, uh, that same place. Second, regarding your second uh, um, question, that is exactly why, why I said there is no liberal order, because regarding free speech, uh, free cho uh, chose uh, uh, the government, uh, it depends on the time of the government. Um, and that is why it's US-centered. It's not liberal. It's Western and depends on who choose. Sophia, I don't know if you want to Frankly, add something. I have not, I, I, I agree totally there it is. what was said. Thank you so much uh, to our guests and thank you so much for the audience and for all the, the questions and also the audience that is following us back home. Uh, through streaming. Um, it was a pleasure to be here and to, to discuss this topic and hear such interesting opinions and, and takes on this. Um, the Economy of Viva will end here. Um, thank you very much and I hope you had, if you have um, heard interesting ideas that might have um, started some, some discussions in, in our own heads, which is also quite important. Thank you so much. Hello, uh, and now we will begin our uh, uh, closing ceremony, so please stay, and please welcome to the stage uh, our president of Economia Viva, Joana Leitão. Dear audience, those here at campus and those watching live, thank you so much for coming. It was a great honor to be able to organize Economia Viva 2022. Now, at the end of the event, I have to thank everyone and every institution that has worked with us during the last nine months and has made all of this possible. Firstly, I would like to thank our co-organizers, the European Commission. Today we have here with us Sofia Merit Souza that you have just heard and she is the president, the, um, the head of the European Commission's representation in Portugal. I would also like to thank personally Anika. Thank you so much for your kindness and support. This event could not have happened the way it did without your help. 
I would also like to thank one of our sponsors, the Bank of Portugal, here represented by Ana Paula Serra, member of the Board of Directors. Thank you for being with us for so many years and for, con for continuing to believe in this student-led event. Thank you to Fidelidad, our newest sponsor, to Nova SBE, namely to Andrea Alves, Ana Ferreira and Ana Castela, to Nova SU, to Câmara Municipal de Cascais and to the technical teams that have been working with us during the last couple of days, Show 28 and Blatt. I have also, of course, to thank my wonderful team, Diogo Oliveira, Isabel Caldeira and Daniel Silva. Your hard work and efforts, particularly in these last couple of weeks, were imperative to the success of this initiative. Thank you also to the remaining members of Nova Economics Club, especially those in the task force of the event. Finally, thank you to all of the speakers and moderators that accepted our invitation and that have contributed to the discussion. A couple of years ago, when I was beginning my master's degree, I remember coming across some surprising data regarding the trust, or rather mistrust, the citizens had regarding economists. As it was exposed in a book, Good Economics for Hard Times, when it came to the trust that people had in certain professions, when they were talking about their area of expertise, economists came second, coming from the bottom. Only politicians were worse than economists. According to that data, only 25% of people trusted economists' views on, well, the economy. This can, of course, be justified by many reasons. Maybe it is due to the fact that we have an ungrateful and impossible mission of studying something that is too complex, too unpredictable, something that is, at the same time, too mathematical and too social, something that is constantly changing as the human behavior evolves. Or maybe we have simply not been able to communicate our ideas clearly. Maybe, as it happens with other types of sciences, we have been producing we have been producing knowledge for our own community, forgetting the great impact it has on public policy and consequently on people's lives, and how important it is that they understand it. Or maybe we have just not been able to truly discuss things between ourselves. Or maybe the famous usage of words and expressions such as maybe, or on the other hand, despite being truthful to the knowledge that we have about, well, the economy, are not necessarily the best thing to contribute for our credibility. Regardless of the possible, the possible reasons behind this mistrust, it was clear back then, as much as it is now, that events such as Economy of Eva play a major role in fighting it by promoting a healthy, and, a healthy and honest discussion of ideas, open not only to students, but also to the rest of the community. This is why, despite knowing the amount of work that went into the preparation of this event and seeing how tired and hick was last year, I decided to accept this challenge. An increasing challenge indeed due to the unpredictability of the pandemic situation. Economy Viva is the biggest cycle of conferences about economics organized by students in Portugal. This is the sentence that we keep on repeating for seven years already. But it is much more than that. It is a place to learn, to discuss, and most importantly, to understand. In the seventh edition, we brought economists, politicians, and academics to sit together and discuss monetary policy, the future of Europe, higher education, inequality and public policy, as well as international politics. We aimed at having a more we aim at having more diverse opinions, at having gender balanced panels, and at increasing the projection of the event. We knew that having a mixed model with online speakers and the live stream of the event was certainly going to be challenging but it was necessary to achieve our goals. And despite some technical issues that we had in the beginning, I think it all ended up well. I think it is also safe to say that we have reached those goals, that we have honored our motto, which is for all opinions, for all issues, and for all minds. And that we have also kept the legacy of last year's edition, to share the event from the Nova SBE to the rest of the world. To the founding members of Nova Economics Club and Economia Viva, as well as to the, all of the members that have preceded them, thank you. To the current and future members of Nova Economics Club and to the future organizers of Economy Viva, I wish you the best of luck. I'm sure you will do a great job. Once again, dear audience, I must say thank you. Obrigada. Thank you very much, Joana, for your words. And now, uh, I would like you to welcome Ana Paula Serra, member of the board of Banco de Portugal.
evening, I'm standing be between you. I'm standing between your dinner, your weekend, and so I'm going to be very short. I had prepared a short speech that I will ask the organization then to share it online because I don't think that we have the conditions now to for uh, for a, a very long speech. And of course, my words go to thank Nova Economics Club and Nova Students Union for inviting me to close this ceremony. And uh, it is a pleasure to be here, back uh, to face-to-face -face format in this beautiful campus. As it has been said, uh, it is the top conference uh, cycles in Portugal fully organized by students. And it is a very good example of how universities can foster uh, leadership thought uh, to, so that to make sure that students are intervening in central society debates. So I, I only witnessed this last debate as you were, and I thought it rather interesting, but there were very, very fruitful and lively debates that, that I could watch online and uh, delivered by notable speakers, and I also thank them. So, uh, congratulate, and also a view of being here uh, just at the uh, end of the week, and uh, of course, this is, this is truly shows that you are interested. So, as I said, I had prepared a speech on monetary policy, and I'm not going to go through it now, I will share it with you, so please check our website with our thoughts in terms of what was the review of the Eurosystem monetary policy strategy, and of course, uh, what were the main decisions that we made and, the, and the decided in July, and, and all the debate that we have now, given that we have several surprises in terms of the inflation numbers in recent times. So hopefully you'll have time to read it and uh, sh the opportunity to share our thoughts. But I wanted also to leave you with a word in terms of how do we stand Bank Portugal in terms of being, being close to several audiences. And of course, young people for us are really important so that we make sure that our messages uh, do, do spread. And this is, of course, one of these opportunities. So that's why I thank economic, uh, all the, all the economy, economy Aviva for being part of this, uh, of this forum where we can discuss very important topics. So thank you to Economia Vida, thank you to you all, and have a nice weekend. Thank you very much. This is the end of a long week, and uh, thank you for coming, and see you next year. <laughs>